We're back. It's Wednesday. It's double A SLR once again. And Hal's here. Woohoo! How you doing, Hal? I'm awesome, man. You know, like my demo would be so much better if we could have that hype music like running in the background. It'd be like like so theatrical. It'd be like, you know, like a <laughs> hacking montage or something. It'd be, it'd be I I could make that happen, but I don't know. Some people complain about that. We do yeah, get that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, what what is the demo? Gonna be it's about so, keys. Uh, You're gonna give us some keys. Yeah, you know, I thought um like I've been I've been like blue team all my life, but but I thought that I would um maybe uh, talk about some some stuff that we're seeing uh on the incident response side, but uh it was give it a little more of a red team flavor and kind of look at it from the adversary's perspective. So Sweet. I want to talk about uh a little bit of, of Linux hacking um and uh using uh, living off the land a little bit and using found SSH keys for lateral movement, which is um, a tactic that we're seeing uh, adversaries doing at least a little bit. And I think that we'll be seeing a lot more of it um, as as they get more sophisticated. So, Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can do cool, your thanks, thing. Ryan. All right, man. We'll see you later. Um, hey, everybody putting on my, my red team hat uh, and um, we uh, were checking this out. So uh, hopefully this font is readable for everybody. Okay, so here's the situation, right? I, um, you all are probably familiar with using uh, SSH, uh, like dynamic port forwarding and things like that for, for pivoting around in your red team engagements. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about another kind of living off the land tactic, which is leveraging SSH key material that you find um, on the systems that you you've popped to then you know move laterally onto other machines. Um, in in large enterprise uh, Linux and Unix environments, there's a lot of automated SSH activity, for example, that uses public key based authentication um, to allow, say, one machine to reach out to another system, run automated tasks. Um, users use public key authentication to create kind of a frictionless login environment for themselves. And it's all based on these public and private key pairs um, that you'll often find sitting in users uh, .ssh folders in their home directories. So, um, you know, the, the idea is, you know, it's pretty straightforward public key crypto, right? You, if you want to use this form of authentication, you use a program called SSH KeyGen, generates a public and private key pair. The private key, your identity certificate basically, is encrypted normally with a passphrase to prevent other people from stealing it. Um, your public key you go out and you place in a configuration file called authorized keys on the remote systems you want to log into. So when you go and you log into that remote system, the remote server uses your public key, encrypts a challenge using the public key, and sends it back to your client for decryption. If you're able to decrypt the private key, which allows you to decrypt the challenge, that's you know proof of you are who you say you are. You're the owner of the private key. So, and then the remote server lets you log in because you were able to decrypt the challenge. So the whole basis of security here is protecting your private key material. Um, now, normal users would do that with a passphrase, but you know, automated tasks like cron jobs and things like that, there isn't going to be anybody around to type a passphrase. And consequently, you'll often find sensitive administrative accounts that have keys with null passphrases um, so that automated tasks can use them without having to, you know, have somebody at the keyboard entering the passphrase to decrypt the key. So, you know, once you get onto the system and once you break root, the thing is to go around and look in users dot ssh directories for these key files now the problem is looking at at these key files and i've just got a couple of examples here 
Um, so what you'll see is you'll see, you know, in users.sh directories, you'll see like a file like ID underscore RSA and then a, a file ID RSA our ID underscore RSA dot pub, right? And the dot pub file is the public key. Um, and then the ID underscore RSA file is the secret key, which may or may not be protected with a passphrase. But there's no way to tell necessarily by looking at that secret key, whether it's passphrase protected or not, right? So I've generated two different keys, one with a passphrase and, and one without just to to demo that for you, right? So if you look at the key that, you know, has no passcode associated with it, it's just, you know, it's a, a private key block with, you know, it's base 64 encoded. Um, so, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at the one that has, that I set a passcode on, it looks exactly the same. It's a base 64 encoded private key block. Um, and so, you know, the first question is as you're, going around and you're looking in different users dot SSH directories, how do you know which ones are, you know, not passphrase protected and you can use immediately and which ones, you know, do you maybe have to do some cracking on? So um, the trick is the same program that you use to generate the keys, which is SSH key gen also has a passphrase verification mode. So if I do SSH key gen dash Y, which is the, the verification mode, dash P, which was be how you would specify the passphrase on the command line, but I'm going to specify a null passphrase. So, you know, dash P empty. Um, and then you pick a key file. So let me do the one with no passcode first. Okay. So the fact that it returns, what it's returning here is the public key associated with that private key. So the fact that it returned that public key means that the file that you were looking at does not have a passcode associated with it. On the other hand, if I tried that same command on the file that has a passcode, you get that error output. It says, sorry, it has a passcode, but you didn't give me the right one. Um, so that's a quick way of validating for any given key file whether it's wide open and doesn't have a passphrase or whether you know, you've got some work to do to try and crack the encryption on that um, identity certificate. And yet, I mean, there are brute forcers out there that will try and crack the encryption on those um, SSH identity keys. But you know, if the person has chosen a reasonably long passphrase, you know, good luck with that is all I'll say. Okay, so um, you know that's one way that you can find uh, keys to play around with is they're just sitting there in files on disk. Um, and you know, I would urge you to look in you know like roots.ssh folder because oftentimes there are automated tasks running out of there with root privilege, or look at individual users folders. And and what I've seen, you know, I, I do incident response um, for my day job. Um, you know, what we're seeing in the Linux environment is adversaries coming in with uh, automated scripts that will run through the system, harvest all of the key files that they can find from users.ssh folders and try using them to move laterally throughout the network. But it turns out that, um, and, and I haven't seen this yet, but I'm expecting to see it. Uh, there's another source of these identity certificates sitting around on a lot of Linux systems because SSH supports this feature called SSH agent, which is a key storage mechanism, right? So like if I wanted to, to log in someplace with this key that's protected with a passcode, I would have to type that passcode every time I went to log in with that key. Um, and that, you know, I mean, if you're a sysadmin and you log in dozens of times per day, that gets to be kind of a pain in the butt. So SSH agent allows you to add your key to this agent storage, uh, which sits in memory running in the background. And then your SSH clients 
can automatically communicate with that SSH agent process and get challenges decrypted without you having to type the passphrase. And it all just happens transparently. Um, and I think I've got that set up here. Hold on a minute. Uh, okay. So I think if I SSH uh, to 192, 168, 10, uh, 131. Yeah, boom. So I, I just, you know, like you didn't see me typing a password or passphrase or anything. I just got logged in and strong authentication happened. The server sent me a challenge, but my SSH agent process in the background just decrypted that challenge and provided it as a proof of who I was. And the, the magic happens through this environment variable called SSH auth sock. So, um, that variable holds the path name to a Unix domain socket that your SSH client uses to communicate with that SSH agent process running in the background. And you can see SSH add is how you add keys into the memory of that SSH agent process. If I do SSH add dash L, you can see I've got a couple of keys loaded into the memory of that SSH agent process running in the background. And so, when I get a challenge from a remote server, like the one I just logged into, that challenge gets fed through that SSH auth sock to the SSH agent process, which decrypts the challenge and then sends it uh, out to the server I'm trying to log into. So it's this nice kind of almost single sign-on mechanism for SSH and it's pretty addictive. I mean, once you are aware of this functionality and start using it, I, I couldn't imagine managing a large network of Linux systems without it, honestly. So, <clears throat> so the problem is though, those keys are sitting in memory and they're accessible or well, through the SSH agent process is accessible through this SSH auth sock. Now, if I'm a bad person and I've gotten in and I've broken root, I can talk to your SSH auth sock and log in as you using your keys. I can't actually steal your keys, but I can use the keys in your SSH agent process to impersonate you. And so one of the things you should also check once you've popped a Linux system is look for these SSH auth socks that you can maybe leverage some keys out of, right? So there are keys sitting around on disk, which may or may not be encrypted, but there's also all of these SSH auth socks on the system that you may be able to leverage as well. And so the trick for finding those that I found easiest, LSOF dash capital U, is gonna output all of the Unix domain sockets in the Linux environment. And then you're just gonna grep for ones that are related to the keyword SSH. It's kind of quick and dirty, but you know, it works. Okay. And you'll get some stuff that, you know, is an interesting, like, you know, just ignore all these ones that say socket, whatever. The ones you want to pay attention to are, are these, you know, the ones that actually have a path name associated with them, right? Those are SSH auth socks associated with, you know, you can see here, this one's associated with an SSH agent process. This one's associated with a process called gnome keyring daemon, um, which is the uh, gnome desktops keyring, and it can store SSH keys like an SSH agent process. Um, and then this one's also interesting. So this one you'll notice is associated with an SSHD process. This is something that's called agent forwarding, right? So somebody has logged into this system as the lab user with agent forwarding turned on. This socket here communicates with the SSH daemon that they're logged into, which in turn is forwarding those agent requests back to the user's client. So, and communicating with the SSH agent process on a machine one hop away 
to do authentication. Agent forwarding is really powerful, but it also means that an adversary who jumps into an intermediate system like that can leverage keys from your primary desktop potentially to log in throughout the network, right? And that is pretty evil, okay? All right, so, so I'm an attacker and I've um, located these different SSH auth socks that are available on this live system. How do I interact with them? Well, remember the magic variable is SSH auth sock. So I'm rude, I can read from any file. So all I have to do is uh, export SSH auth sock and set it to be one of these uh, paths. I don't know. I'm just going to arbitrarily pick this one. Okay, here we go. And now you can do what I did in the other window. You can do SSH add dash L to see if there's anything, any keys loaded in that agent. Okay. And so this agent doesn't have any keys loaded into it. Okay. Let's try a different one, right? Let's go with the next one on the list. How about this one? Cool. Okay. So there's, you know, a couple of keys loaded into this one. Now, where can I go with those keys? So this socket that I'm using is associated with the user called lab, all right? Now in the home directory for user lab, in their .ssh folder, there's a file called known hosts. This is a file that contains public keys of all of the systems that that lab user has been connecting to. So chances are the keys in the lab user's SSH agent process allow you to log into one of those hosts in the known host file as the lab user. Now, you know, for this demo, there's only one IP address. So I'm going to SSH as lab to the machine 192.168.10.131. Right? So I'm in. So now I've you know successfully moved, at least as an unprivileged user, from the machine I'm on to another host in the network, right? And you know, uh, bring along a privilege escalation exploit and away you go. And you can keep following your nose like this. Ch chances are the machine that you're logging into has got some identity certificates or um, you know, whatever. Um, or we can go back to the machine we came from, and if there are other um, hosts listed in the known host file, maybe we can spread out to them as well. And the scripts that I'm seeing the adversaries deploying, you know, they they gather together all the SSH keys they can find, and all the known hosts files they can find, and um, you know, try and move laterally to to all of those combinations. Uh, I haven't yet seen them leveling up to looking for SSH agent processes, but somebody will figure that out at some point. One thing you can do to slow them down, there's an SSH um, option called hash known hosts. So rather than the IP address of the machines being visible in the known host file, um, here, let me show you this. You get... Uh, you get entries that look like this. They're hashed. Um, so the the you know they're one way hashed with um, you know a, a known algorithm, um, so that you can't immediately read the IP addresses out of here. So that hash known host option is definitely something that you can turn on to slow down attackers. Now, um, that being said, there are brute forcers out there. There's a, there's a known host uh, brute forcing Python script that I've used, or sort of Perl script. Anyway, um, because the hashing algorithm is you know it's published, it's open source. Um, you, it is possible to write a brute forcer to try and um, you know reverse these known host entries. 
But again, it at least you know slow your adversary down a little bit um, if the IP address or host name isn't immediately visible in the the known host entry. Okay, but anyway, so that's the basic idea. Like when you get onto the system, look for these key files in users.ssh directories. Look for running SSH agent processes um, using this LSOF trick that I showed you. Um, try communicating with those SSH agent processes and seeing if there are keys loaded in them. And then use the known host entries that you find in users.ssh directories as you know potential sources of places you could move out to. Um, there may be others. I mean, you could just simply you know try and um, you know sweep out the entire uh, network range for the the client and see if you can get you know places that aren't listed in the known host file. Um, but you know certainly the known host is a good starting point of places that you can get to uh, from this system. And um, you know pretty much here ended the lesson. Um, hopefully this will help you on your next uh, red teaming engagement to increase your your penetration of your uh, client's network. People are not as good as they should be, frankly, about um, you know uh, protecting this key material. So um, there's a lot of opportunity I find in most Linux environments to to leverage this stuff. Now is the time to ask your questions to Hal, if you have any. I, I didn't see any, uh, or too many, while you were demoing. Um, one question was, what machine was that? But I'm not sure if you, if the person was talking about you or one of the commenters. Uh, oh, no, I think it was the, the comment right before it. I was working on a box uh, that disclosed private SSH key on a web page and passphrase through the hard yeah, exploit. Yeah. That's what I thought it was too. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the, you know, uh, the, the norm in so many Linux environments is that there are uh, scheduled tasks like cron jobs running with root privilege using keys with null passphrases. It's almost trivial, you know, uh, once you find one of those to just migrate around the network and, and, you know, the ransomware folks just love stuff like that. They will, they are, all over that um and uh you can you know a, a lot of damage can happen to your environment very quickly if you allow mm -hmm. that sort of thing to happen so just let's be careful out there people um yes indeed well now's probably a good time to tease your your next okay. siphon training yeah uh which is we don't have public uh dates yet but the next class you have told me is going to be the command line dojo yeah so uh and if you, if you like the command line that. stuff i did on this one um this is uh it's a two-day class i put together on a whole bunch of linux shell stuff just from, we start with the basics and uh by the end you're doing you know loops and substitutions and and uh all kinds of crazy stuff with the command line that uh I've learned over the, let's see, when did I touch, doing, doing the math in my head. Wow, okay, um, <laughs> 37 years of uh, Unix and Linux command line for me. I, I, I touched my first Unix system in 1985. Uh, that's, wow. That's okay. So if you've been doing anything for 30 years, you probably ought to be pretty decent at it. And I, I like to think I'm pretty decent at the, the Linux command line. Um, uh, for those of you who've made the great Mastodon migration, you can find me over on InfoSec Exchange, and oh, yeah. uh, I'm doing daily Linux command line trivia there too. So if you if you just can't wait for the class, um, come come find me over on uh, I'm Hal underscore Pomeranz at InfoSec Exchange on Mastodon, and there's a a daily Linux uh, uh, trivia. Sweet. Any tips for where to go? Any tips for someone looking to become a threat analyst? Threat analyst. Um, you know, I, I would. So you know, this is you know, going to be an unpopular answer, but um, th there is no short path to this. 
But the, the good news is um, you, you know, everything that you're learning remotely related te to technology makes you a better threat analyst because you never know from day to day what's going to be useful. And, and I always tell people, you know, if you want to get into information security, a good broad background in everything related to computing from, from networking to operating systems to, you know, programming, all of it helps, right? Because it all feeds into, um, you know, different adversary behaviors and things like that. And, and nobody has to know everything. Um, you know, I, the, there's so much to know, right? That it's part of the Im imposter syndrome problem that we have in the industry. Like everybody's like, oh my God, these people are geniuses and they know everything. Mm -hmm. No, they just know more than you about certain things. Um, but I mean, like I said, I've been doing Unix for 30 odd years and, and I am still learning stuff. Like, you know, just the other day, like people were sending me to school on better ways of doing my command line challenges. And I think, to, so for me, that's great. I mean, that's learning new stuff is what gets me out of bed. So, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I've always been fascinated about computers. So, you know, for somebody looking to become a threat analyst right now, the great news is, is there's a ton, just a ton of free stuff out there now. Um, all my classes are um, out on archive.org. Uh, you'll find links actually in my Mastodon profile. Um, you can just download them for free with the, with the lab VMs. So you can work through it on your own. The command line class isn't out there yet because I haven't quite finished typing up all the notes, but it will be um, before you know I teach it next. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's all these universities that are putting out uh, free material, free classes that you can study. Um, you know, obviously anti-siphon's doing pay what you can stuff that's out there that's great. Like uh, John Strand's uh, SOC class, which is a great, you know, broad intro to a lot of this technology. So there's so many free resources out there. Just, you know, find something that you're interested in and start wailing away at it. Um, everything you learn will make you a better analyst, whether it's a SOC analyst, threat analyst, you want to become an incident responder or whatever. Um, you know, the more you do, the the matter, the more you know. Um, command line for babies, there's, you know, some good, there's a good um, intro to the Linux command line uh, from no starch uh, out there. Um, there's there's the the old AT&T uh, labs book that I learned command line from, which is the Unix, it's called the Unix programming environment. It's by Kernahan and Pike. It's still a good book. Um, even though it was, you know, written in the 1980s. Um, um, but, you know, the basics of the Unix shell haven't changed that much. Um, so, you know, just just start learning and never stop. The, the best piece of advice was from one of my, I guy was from one of my early mentors, Celeste Stokely. And she told me, you know, learn one big new thing every year. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, it could be, you know, uh, reverse engineering, it could be, um, you know, messing around with hardware hacking or lock picking or, or whatever it is, but learn one big new thing every year. That's, that's the key for having a long career, um, in, in this field, you know, cause you learn all this knowledge that's connected, you know, and so you, you, you keep gathering knowledge and that's, you know, it can be exhausting, but it's also for me, just a lot of fun. What was the uh, the name of the AT and T book again? It's called the Unix Programming Environment. It's by Kernahan. Uh, Unix Price. Programming Environment. Let me see if I can find it on Amazon here. Hold on. Uh, oops, no, that's not where I want to be. Uh, what am I doing here? Keep opening up tabs in the wrong thing. All right, hold on. Unix. There we go. While he's looking for that, I'm going to Here answer the other question about the the price of the class is 575 for 16 hour class for anti-siphon yeah. training 
Um, am I still screen sharing, Ryan? Or no, you're not. Okay, hold on. Do you want me? To, you want me to bring you up? Yeah, so I, I've All got right. it up on my browser. Oh, there um, you are. Okay. Yep. So um, I think first it's out edition. Of, yeah. Well, you don't have to buy the first edition. Um, anyway, uh, this is this is a classic book. It came out in 1985, I think. And you know, I, had I known uh, how much of an impact this book would have had on my future career, I, I I'm not sure I would have picked it up. But anyway, um, this was this was the book back in the 1980s that taught you the Unix shell, which at that time was the Born shell. Um, Anyway, it's still remarkably useful, um, and it has you know you know short chapters and and little exercise prompts at the end of each chapter to get you into the basics of Born Shell. But anyway, the No Starch book on uh, Linux command line is also quite good. Uh, nice. All right. This sounds this sounds like a bit of uh, trivia questions here. Uh, Hal, I got two questions for you your single favorite moment in Linux history and why, and your favorite non Linux Nix OS. I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah. Maybe you do. My favorite non Linux Unix operating system is basically what they're asking. Um, okay. Let me do the second question first. So um, in 1985, when I first started using Unix, I was using Unix on an old BSD Sun OS box. And, and I have to say that BSD Unix is kind of, always been my first love. And so I would say as far as non Linux operating systems, I would probably go with OpenBSD, um, which, you know, I've used a fair amount. Um, but, you know, some probably BSD flavor of Unix, because that's, you know, you never forget your first, right? Um, and um, I would say, by, by the way, I, not to bag on SGI, but I would say that IRIX is my least favorite Unix operating system that I've had to use, but that was only because I was forced to admin IRIX boxes during a time when uh, IRIX was a very, very unstable operating system. It was just a huge thorn in my side. Um, okay, favorite moment in Linux history. Hmm. Hmm. It's um, an interesting question. Let me think about that. Um, you know, so, okay, growing up with Unix in the 1980s, like I did, in the 1980s, we were constantly arguing, uh, and there was huge religious warfare, about which of the commercial Unix flavors of the time, be it SunOS or Irix or Ultrix or, or you know, whatever, AIX came later, um, HPUX, which of them was going to become the single Unix standard? And, and the hilarious thing about that is for all of the, that argument, what ended up happening is that none of them ended up becoming the Unix standard. I mean, the, the Unix standard these days is Linux, like it or not. I mean, that is that is the, um, you know, the, the standard. And so, I, you know, for me, kind of like my favorite Linux moment was, I think, and it was also a really sad moment for me, but it was basically um, the the moment when um, I realized that that Solaris, which was kind of the last viable commercial Unix operating system, really obviously became a legacy operating system. And I and I mark that date from the the date that Oracle purchased Sun Microsystems um, when when that purchase occurred, because it was obvious that the purchase for Oracle was all about um, Java and, and had nothing to do with the Solaris operating system. Cause, cause Oracle had been, been, you know, very active in on Linux for a long time uh, before the Sun Microsystems acquisition. So it was obvious that when Oracle bought Sun, that Solaris's days as a viable operating system were, were, you know, essentially over. Um, you know, and so we still have, look, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, there's still a lot of Solaris out there and there's still HPUX and AIX and all that stuff. But but at this point, they become legacy operating systems. Nobody is rushing to do new deployments uh, of Solaris, right? Um, and, you know, and so that to me was the end of the proprietary Unix era, which is, you know, of course, the era that I grew up in. So 
it was kind of a sad moment, but it was also, I think, a real bellwether for the Linux community. It was just like, okay, you know, we're here and and we've we've won the marketplace and and um, you know, Unix going forward is going to be some flavor of uh, of of Linux. Um, and yeah, you know, like FreeBSD and OpenBSD are still out there, but if you talk to, you know, like the independent software vendors or most of the hosting providers, they're not talking about targeting FreeBSD and OpenBSD installations. They're talking about, you know, targeting Linux as a platform. So, you know, so that's it. I mean, Linux won, right? Um, and I think for me, that's that's maybe my, um, my favorite Linux memory. I have another one that's maybe a little bit mean, but um, when, whenever I feel bad about, you know, the state of open source software or anything like that, <clears throat> I love to go watch the, the documentary Revolution OS and in particular watching the segment where they're interviewing Richard Stallman and he's alibying for why nobody uses his herd microkernel and everybody went, you know, with the monolithic Linux kernel. And, it, you know, and he's like, Blah, 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 you know, um, the herd is like technically better and all this stuff. Yeah. And and the answer is, yeah, but like you couldn't get it to market and everybody went to Linux. And and I just have this like sort of wonderful, like sort of moment of schadenfreude as, as, as I'm watching RMS, like trying to alibi for why his, you know, technically perfect microkernel never like actually won in the marketplace of ideas. And, and that also like gives me a little bit of, of Linux joy kind of thing. So anyway, uh, what is the what issue? What is the biggest with issue with open source software? Huh? Um, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest issues with open source software is this kind of fallacy, you know, people believe that, oh, because it's open source, it's more secure, right? It's like the argument that, you know, oh, well, it's got, you know, millions of eyes on it. So, you know, so we flush out bugs rapidly. The reality is, is that most open source code is not thoroughly reviewed, um, you know, because the developer is doing it. You know, it's it's like, this is not their day job, right? They're they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. And, and you know, maybe they're not, you know, uh, checking this as rigorously as possible. I mean, we're not for for projects like OpenBSD who are aggressively going through and trying to find bugs in the open source software collection. I mean, I think we'd have a lot more exploitable vulnerabilities than we do, but, you know, I mean, you only have to look at the history of Linux privilege escalations, particularly kernel privilege escalations. I mean, like if any code in the Linux code base is getting scrutinized, it's gotta be the Linux kernel. And yet, you know, we're finding over and over again, these, um, kernel privilege escalations. Uh, I mean, it's almost comical. So, you know, I, there's a temptation to somehow believe the hype that open source software is more secure because it's supposedly getting all these people looking at it. But I, I don't necessarily believe that that's true. I, you know, I think that um, the main people who are looking at it are people who are looking for vulnerabilities, you know, that they can use as their, their next zero day to, to penetrate that hard target. I mean, but, you know, we, it, what I will say about open source software is once the vulnerability is known, fixing it is pretty rapid, um, you know, because the, the software is open source and you're not single sourcing, you know, a vendor to, to patch the operating system or whatever on their time frame. There is a whole community of people who are going to jump all over that bug really fast um, and a decentralized network for pushing out updates. So that's, I mean, I, that to me is the upside for open source software, but, but believing that somehow open source software is inherently more secure, I, I don't buy it, you know? Um, cool. Okay. Well, it looks like that's the end of our questions. Cool. So I, th I think we'll call it a show. All right. Any last fine. words for the, not last words, but <laughs> yeah, that sounds rather final. Would you like it? to summarize <laughs> your demo today or, or anything else you want to add um, in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, like, again, once you, you know, once you get into that Linux box, um, don't forget that you may be able to pivot 
off of there using you know these SSH keys like I've shown you. Um, so lots of lots of good stuff there. You can get mm -hmm. really very far with this, uh, particularly in environments that where they like to use agent forwarding. Because what that means is that one key is going to get you all the way through their environment end to end, um, which is which is hugely useful. All right. Well, if you guys enjoyed that little AMA, uh, follow Hal on Mastodon and uh, you'll yeah. see all his trivia stuff. Yeah. And with that, we're going to end the stream and kill it with fire. Bye, everybody.